I don't think we like getting advice. I think we'll tolerate instruction if we're ignorant about a topic or, or a, a task that we need to learn about. We will seek after knowledge. We'll undergo certain training. But once we've become proficient in a profession or a hobby or a task, we don't like other people offering us advice, especially if we haven't asked them for any advice. Now, maybe I'm overstepping, saying we. Um, maybe I should replace it just with the pronoun I. I don't like getting advice, um, even if it's helpful and true advice. Um, I remember it, my high school English teacher from freshman year, Mrs. Hughes. Uh, I had always been a good student. I had been a good writer. But Mrs. Hughes was brutal. She was infamous throughout the school for being known as the one who graded papers with a green pen. And the word was she used a green pen instead of the traditional red pen for corrections in order to soften the blow when you saw how much ink had been written on your paper that you worked so hard on. Now, Mrs. Hughes, being a good teacher, when she quietly returned that paper to you, uh, gave you an opportunity to take her advice and her corrections and rework and resubmit the paper. I hated that. I didn't want any green corrections on my paper. I only wanted to receive words of praise and adoration. Uh, I didn't want to have to rework and resubmit this paper. I had worked very hard on it the first time. I had no interest in learning and growing to become a better writer. I just wanted to be a good writer. Same thing's true with theater. Uh, in the dress rehearsals, before the first performance, the director no longer stops the production in order to make corrections for the cast and crew, but instead sits alone in the audience with a yellow legal pad taking notes. And so after the performance is over, the cast and crew gathers out there in the seats to hear what they did wrong where you missed a dance step, where you missed an entrance, how you weren't committed to that moment. And they do this in front of all the other people there so that every person hears every other person's note. And on top of that, the director is not interested in your feedback on these notes. They simply want to hear you say thank you to know that you have heard what they've had to say. You're not allowed to defend why you made that choice or why you did what you did. I hated getting notes. I just wanted my performance to be right. And I don't think I'm the only one who doesn't want to get advice like this. I do think it's a collective we. Y'all know the old adage, it takes 10 compliments to make one criticism hearable. That's because our brains are so hardwired to remember the critique that we've got to maintain this ratio of 10 words of praise to one critique in order for the person not to devolve into a puddle of shame or into a dragon of defense of their ego. You want one more example of how I think we collectively resist advice? This involves another individual, uh, Wilt Chamberlain. Wilt Chamberlain is one of the greatest basketball players of all time. On March 2nd, 1962, he did something that no one in NBA basketball had done before and probably no one will ever do again. He scored 100 points in a single game. And even more remarkable, on his way to those 100 points, he made 28 out of 32 free throws. Free throws are the shots you take if you get fouled and you stand 15 feet from the basket and you try to throw it in with everybody watching you and no one guarding you. Wilt Chamberlain was a notoriously poor free throw shooter. But in 1962, he adopted a different technique for shooting his free throws. Instead of holding the ball over his head and pushing it towards the basket, the traditional way, he held the ball with both hands, with his hands pointed down, put the ball between his knees, and he lobbed it toward the basket. This greatly improved his accuracy. 
He learned that technique from, uh, from Rick Barry, another contemporary NBA player at the time. Rick Barry was also tall and strong, and those guys in basketball are notorious for being poor free throw shooters. But Rick Barry had thrown his free throws underhand. He's in the Hall of Fame. He has one of the highest percentages of free throw shots made in the history of basketball, and he threw all of his, uh, his shots on free throws underhand. So this sounds like a story where Wilt Chamberlain took some good advice, incorporated it, and improved his game. He'd seen it proven with the stats of Rick Barry. He'd seen his own uh, percentage of free throws improve. But lo and behold, in the following season, Chamberlain went back to shooting free throws overhanded and being a terrible free throw shooter. Now, if you've played basketball, you already know why he did that. What is the term we use to refer to a shot that's put between your knees and thrown up at the basket? What do we call it? A granny shot. (laughs) And so Wilt Chamberlain decided, against good advice, instruction, and evidence, to remain a terrible free throw shooter instead of taking advice of a better technique and improving his percentage but having to endure the jeers and taunts of other fans. Peter, Nathaniel, James, John, Thomas, these other disciples, they are expert fishermen. They cast off on the sea, ready for a night of fishing, but yet in the morning they discover that they've caught nothing. And just as the sun is beginning to crest, the horizon line as they're stretching their aching backs and yawning with exhaustion, pulling in the nets to go back to shore and call it quits. A guy shows up on the beach. They don't recognize who he is. And he says, children, you don't have any fish, do you? That's not what you want to hear after you've been out all night fishing and caught nothing. It's like telling high school seniors the night after prom, you're going to come ring handbells and be honored in the 11 o'clock worship service. It's not something you want to hear. Sorry about that. It's like getting back that paper with all that green ink on it when you'd worked so hard. It's, uh, it, 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 it's like going out after the performance sweaty and exhausted from the dressing room only to hear where you'd messed up, where you'd flubbed a line, how you needed to tighten up the dialogue. It's like shooting free throw after free throw and clanging it off the back rim and having somebody suggest, hey, have you tried the granny shot? The disciples' response to this stranger is one word, no. That's not an invitation to further conversation. And yet the stranger continues to talk. Throw your nets on the right side of the boat and you will find some. Now, we're not ancient fishermen, so we don't necessarily know what Jesus is saying in this moment. But in Mediterranean fishing of this time, it was customary to cast your nets on the left side of the boat so that you could use the dominant right hand when pulling in the net. And you'd be able to reach across your body and use all your strength to pull the haul back into the boat. You wouldn't cast your net on the right side of the boat because you would have to use your weaker left hand and you might not be able to get all the fish on board. It's the granny shot of fishing. But the inexplicable part of this story is that the disciples, for whatever reason, do just that against all their experience, all their ego, all their expertise. And lo and behold, they catch 153 fish, which they can't pull back up into the boat, but they get them to shore and their nets are unbroken. I think this story tells us something about the Christian life. It's an openness to rethinking all the things we've assumed to be true. It's an openness to risk looking silly before others. 
It's an openness to this word, this advice, that could move our lives in an unexpected direction, which might also allow us to relinquish our obsession with our own ego. Today is a day when we are celebrating the casting of our boats out onto the open water. The baptism of a child claimed in the grace of God. Who knows what Isabella will face in her years of life? How will we accompany her? Will we, with her, throw our nets on the right side of the boat, obedient to the Lord's command together? We're honoring graduates today. You all have built resumes. You have written essays you have turned in applications, you've gotten into schools, you've lined up jobs, you've spent all these years proving to other people that you're worthwhile, proving to other people that you can be independent. But the truth of the Christian life is that we first acknowledge that we are dependent, not self-assured. It is to believe what Jesus says about us before any other word about who we are, and in listening to his word over us even more closely than we listen to our own hearts. And then today we enter a new relationship between pastor and congregation, this time of sabbatical. There will be guest theologians and staff stepping up and elders and deacons leading in the life of the church. This is a time to grow together in a different way, through renewal and restoration. This is our chance to throw our nets on the right side of the boat. You see, I think that none of us liked taking advice because it challenges the name that we try to build for ourselves whether it's my ego or Wilt Chamberlain's or parents with a newborn baptized child or graduates of high school and college ready to change the world or whether it's a church community. What we find is as we're trying to make our own life in our way, throwing the nets off the left side of the boat over and over again, we often wake up exhausted from a sleepless night and we've caught nothing. The invitation here is to listen to the word of the Savior, to claim his calling on us above anything else that would claim us. And in that, we will discover a life of wholeness. We can cast our nets on the right side of the boat and find that there we can discover life. And I believe that's more than just some sound advice.